You got your mama's sunshine. You got your daddy's rain. You're like a piece of heaven in a hurricane. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Off the Mountain Podcast. And if you're a regular listener, you notice that I'm starting it off because Josh isn't here today. He wasn't filling up to par. And so we encouraged him just to stay home and rest. So I'm here, and my name is Pastor Ron Vietti, and I'm here with Vince Sierra and Pastor Jim Cruz from uh, Thousand Oaks Atmosphere. Hello. And so there's three of us today, and uh, we're going to be talking about planning for the future. Mm. And, um, you know, I just got back from a dermatologist appointment because I... I look at the future all the time and try to have those once a year. And I went today, and I think it's one of the first times I have left the dermatologist without even, they didn't even burn anything off. Wow. Uh, You know, of all places, I got a cancer on my nose, uh, what, a year and a half ago or two? And they had to cut my nose, and it's right on the tip of my nose. And uh, so today they said, you know what? You got a bright red dot in the tip of your nose. They said uh, we could either uh, do surgery on it or we can keep burning it. And I said, why is it a danger? No, just for looks. I go, hey, <laughs> at my age, I'm not going to win a beauty contest. So you know what? Right. I'll just be known as Rudolph the Red Nose <laughs> and, Pastor. And I don't think anybody would ever notice it. I know they will. At- yeah, the, now they the, will. Yeah, now that now you, you just said, told us. Now, now, yeah, I just had I'm looking look at for it, but I still can't see it. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, I asked her some today. I thought it was very interesting. I said, can I lay out in the sun? Because I like to get D3. Can I lay out in the sun 15, 20 minutes every day? And, you know, most dermatologists, no. She says, I don't think it'll hurt you at all. And I said, wow, thank you. Because back in the day, and I'll refer to this, I mean, back in uh, the 60s and, and early 70s, we would go to the beach and lay out four hours and bathe ourselves in what? Baby, baby oil. Baby oil. Your daughter tells me bake. about this all the time. I mean, I was so dark, I looked like I was from a different nationality. That's People would crazy. say all the time, look how dark he is. Wow. Can you imagine what we were doing to our skin? <laughs> you were cooking yourselves. I mean, it's amazing that we don't all have multiple skin cancers. Yeah. But don't you think the sun's different? I think today? it has to be. Because back then, I think if you do that today, Lay out four hours with yeah. baby oil on, you'd probably kill yourself. Yeah. Just can't do it. So it had to be different. Mm-hmm. Ozone layer or whatever. Something. So anyway, we're talking about today about uh, planning for the future. See, I, I never did this. When I was younger, I lived for the moment, and I dearly, I think, paid for it. Um, let me give you an example, and I don't want to condemn anybody's doing these things, but I regularly had my hair bleached. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And my hairdresser was really rough. She'd put this, I, I think it's called a skull cap or whatever. And she would take these sharp instruments. She'd poke at my head, pulling this hair out through the holes through in the, the skull cap. cap. Yeah. And my head was actually bleeding, I think. And then she'd throw this bleach on my head with it probably bleeding. And I didn't think about the future. I just wanted to look good, you know, <laughs> at that age. My parents really didn't think of my future too much when they left me out in Arvin, which for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with this area, it's a farming community, big farming community. And they never, you know, asked me what I was doing or, or warned me of anything. And I told you we would, we would drink water regularly out of these standpipes coming out of the ground. Because my cousin who lived out there, he said, you know what? This water, man, it's some of the freshest water you can drink. It comes from <laughs> underground wells. And <laughs> what we didn't know was they were pouring all their fertilizers in that. Oh, mm-hmm. man. And we were drinking it, and he was the one who encouraged us to do it. And unfortunately, he died of cancer at 27. Oh, man. Wow. And so, uh, you know, saving money, as practical as that is, I didn't do that when I was young. All of this centers around planning for the future. And very often when we're young, we don't. Another thing I'll say, and then I'll get you guys in here, the discussion here. My wife wrote an article the other day and shared it with me where it said a lot of millennials today aren't planning for the future because they don't think they have a future. Mm. They don't think there is a future. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, let's just start discussing this idea of planning for the future. Well, I know back in the 70s when you started VBF, 
there was the craze of the rapture. Mm-hmm. And I remember hearing from uh, the owners of the Christian bookstore that I worked at over in San Luis Obispo. They were telling me they were so convinced that Jesus was coming back Yes, that they were not, not caring about anything. There was like, it's all, we're, we're leaving anyway. Mm-hmm. So they had that mentality of just live for the moment because they're like, we're, we're going to leave this earth anyway. Mm, that's so very true. I remember that era and I was so caught up into teaching prophecy that I really felt in prayer one day that God spoke to me and said, Hey, you have everyone with their bags packed, ready to leave. Tell them to unpack their bags. There's some work to do here yet. And, and it was true. We just go, hey, throw caution in the wind. We're not going to be here in 20 years. And we really, really did believe that. And I think the people in the days of Paul kind of believed that too. Mm-hmm. And today we're believing that again. But I think we learned from the past that we're not to, you know, pack our bags right. and just wait for the Lord to come back. We've well, got work to do. We've the, got to work. There's a whole like new uh, segment of Christianity that's they're identifying themselves as rapture weary where they're like, ah, we don't, we don't know. We're not even like banking on that anymore. Interesting. We, yeah. yeah. It's like a, a thing right now. Oh, well, doesn't the Bible say that in the last days people say, ah, uh-huh. you know, in the future, wow, everything's still the same as it always was. And so there's, there's two extremes there. There is. But I, yeah. I don't see too many Christians today that are, uh, as prophetic minded as we were uh, back in the sixties and seventies so, and eighties. Do you still have at the church the fourteen things to do if the rapture comes? <laughs> Tara and I were just talking about this the other day. You know, it's funny. One of the older members, he is on me all the time. Bless his heart, and I love the guy. He says, "Rewrite this thing, put it out there again." Because I did write a track. This is fourteen things to do if you miss the rapture. That's what and it I was. said. Post these all over the place. So when we're gone, people will know what to do. They won't throw in the towel. So yes, uh, we that is still floating around. <laughs> That's awesome. There definitely needs to be a balance too. I think yeah. I love what you said, Jim. There's a their younger generation where they're rapture where we were, we've heard the Lord's coming back, the Lord's coming mm-hmm. back, the Lord's coming back, and then he doesn't come back. And you're and these are people that have put their trust in these leaders and mm-hmm. and and really have committed, you know, their lives to these pastors or people that run these churches that saying, Hey, I promise you the Lord's coming back. And then he doesn't. And then it kind of leads people into, like you said, this idea that is it going to come back? It starts putting a lot of questions um, in their mind, but there has to be a balance between um, living in the moment, being present, and then also planning for the future because you can't, you can't just put all your eggs in the future basket because we have no idea what the future holds. In fact, there's a lot of biblical scriptures that tell us don't worry about the future, you know, like don't, don't live there, but we also um, can't not be prepared for it to an extent, but we also be got to be really present with what's happening right now. Because if all you did was, um, you know, let's just take my kids, for example, and I'm in this moment right now, you guys are past this and you're, you just got out of this gym. Um, but if all I thought about was my kid's future and I was like, okay, I'm stocking money away for their college and what colleges they're going to go to. And I put no effort into what they're doing right now, they probably aren't going to go to college because I'm not present with them. I'm not getting them through high school. I'm not preparing them for what's ahead. And so it's a balance and a mixture of both. And I think that there's a tendency for people to be very future minded where they put a lot of like my 401k. And I'm not saying all these things are bad, by the way, I think these are great things, but they put a lot of stock in the future but they're not really present with people right now. Well, as a millennial, how are you handling that space? Because that was the article, right, Ron? It was. Yeah. Well, so, I'm, I mean, gonna, you're I'm in a, that. I'm in the tell end of it, right? So my my age gap is like I'm at the very like 81, 1981 is like mm-hmm. the the bridge of like where the millennials start and then it goes forward. And um, so there's a big, vast jump in that. And so what I've seen is for the, the people that are in my age group, so I'm going to say like in that 40-year-old age group, um, we don't deal with the same thing that maybe a 35 year old uh, deals with. And the newsfeed today, we talk about the newsfeed a lot. Um, They are talking about the average price of homes. And in order to afford a home now, they're saying, you know, back, you know, like in, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you'd be able to, if you made $50,000, you can buy a $350,000 house. It was very manageable. You could do it. Now they're saying um, the average median like income of the whole, you know, the United States is about a hundred thousand dollars. And in order to buy a house, you have to make up to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year to at seven percent to buy a three hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand dollar house. So what's happening now is parents are having to flip the bill over for their kids in order to get in a house or 
they're not getting out of the house as fast. And so what you're seeing is people, like you said, there's a hopelessness now for people saying they kind of don't see a future. They're like, we're never going to be able to buy a house. We're never going to be able to get the things our parents have. And I, again, this comes back to d down to balance because people are thinking about their future in terms of what they have and what they don't have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, and so that's where in my, in my, in, in a younger generation, mm -hmm. I think we have to get fixated off of the, you know, in order to be successful, you have to own a house. You have to have this job. You have to do this thing. You have to do that thing and get fixated on what, what we're called to do and what's important for us to do. If that makes sense. Yep. Because I, I mean, if you, if I'm honest, there's a lot of people my age that still, um, you talk about this a lot, pastor. And I love it. You said, you're still growing up. Like, what do I want to do now? <laughs> um, but I think there's a realistic, like, uh, coming out now that where people are like saying they don't know, like 40 year olds don't know what they still want to do. Like they're still kind of lost. They're still wondering, you know, 35 year olds for sure. 30 year olds, they're still, they're changing. I mean, in your lifetime, pastor, somebody got a job and they worked that job for how long? A lot of years, a lot of decades. Right. And we now, usually didn't change around. And now you're seeing people jump from job to job to job from this to that to this to that. Um, and I don't know if it's the social pressure or they see things on social media. I, I have, I couldn't answer that question, but there's definitely that jump. Oh, I, I remember reading an article last year. They said the average millennial is staying at a job for five years. Oh, I mean, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then it's hard because That's again, crazy. you, 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 when you were younger, we didn't have social media, so you wouldn't see, or the internet. Yeah. Right. I won't even say social media. You didn't have the, so you couldn't see all these different jobs. And all, so you, your mind didn't go, well, I can go do that. And then you're like, I'm going to move my whole family and do this thing. So you didn't have that. So people, true. when they plan for their future, they kind of thought, oh, I'm going to lock into this one community and this one job. I mean, we see this now people are, we call it the, uh, the California exodus, right? And people are leaving. And one of the things that I love that you said, pastor, maybe a month ago on our podcast is like, stay put in your community instead of, instead of leaving and abandoning your community and saying, I'm never, I'm not going to live in California. I know California is hard, but stay and make it a better place. Don't abandon it and leave it. And we, we've also, you know, when we plan now, we want to be comfortable. So I we're planning gonna, for comfort. And what, and, and I was going to add to that, you know, we're talking about planning for the future. Some people are leaving California because they are planning for the future. And they're like, there's no way I can build a future here. Yes. Because like where we live in Thousand Oaks, right? The average house right now is a million dollars. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's it's insane. A, like the property tax alone, right? On purchasing a million dollar home, somebody was breaking it down for me the other day. I told Tara, I said, "We'll probably never own a house again," but I'm okay with that mm -hmm. because God's blessed us with a house that we're renting right now through a couple that we know. But it's like you know, you start thinking like, "Wow, we could." like live so much better and put so much more money away if we move to a place like Texas or Tennessee. Right. And oh, if you go on the internet and look at house prices in some of those places, mm -hmm. Oklahoma, Texas, Alabama, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to comment on something you said. You are going to own a house if you stay there, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. I believe God has Speak promised. Speak that over me. I'm speaking it right now. Uh, I don't think you should even say, you know, we never, I think God I know has given me a promise. At least I believe it was him. He said, wherever you go to minister, I will make sure that you have whatever you need in that place. Mm. And I think God will make a way for you. I receive uh, it. I, I'm going to, yeah, I'm, maybe I'm a prophet. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but I, I do it. believe you need to start saying that. Yeah. I've told the congregation twice on the last few months. I said, I think for many of us, God's saying, that we need to stop saying God can, and we need to start saying he will. And I'm really into that. But going back to what you were saying, Vince, there needs to be a balance mm -hmm. for sure. And I think we find that balance simply in the words that, that God gives us in Proverbs 16 3, where he says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Uh, I think it goes back to Matthew 6.33. I claim Matthew 6.33 all the time. Uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. And so my goal is to keep doing what God's telling me to do. Uh, I understand uh, people saying, you know what, I want to leave uh, California mm -hmm. uh, because I don't feel I have a future here. Right. But in my case, and I think probably both of you in your cases, 
uh, what we're doing is what that verse said. We're committing our way to the Lord, and the Lord's not letting us leave. He says, I got plans for you right here. And, uh, and, and I think that's what, where we lose uh, mm-hmm. our focus at. Uh, keep doing what God tells you to do. And you know what? You don't have to worry about making a decision where you live. It'll be automatic, I think, to a certain degree, certain degree organic. I, I think there's a tendency to plan, going back to this thought, there's a tendency to plan for comfort. And when we talk about the California Exodus, when we talk about where we want to live, we think about what's going to make me comfortable, right? Mm-hmm. And so we, we start planning for that. I mean, that's the reason why we have retirement and 401k and we reinvest in businesses and all this stuff because we want to make ourselves comfortable and make sure that we're going to be live, we're going to be, we're going to be well off, right? Um, but when you live biblically, sometimes you, you're not planning for comfort. Like you didn't, you moved, you moved away from a really comfortable situation. You, so you were the lead pastor, um, in Las Vegas, you had it made. I mean, you, the church was, and when I say you had it made again, that's not a comfortable situation, but you were doing good there. I, I saw it from afar. I know pastor would agree mm-hmm. with me. It was a going, and it still is a really going because, because of the, the foundation you laid there, but it was a going ministry. And you said, I feel like I'm being called to thousand Oaks. And a lot of people from the outside is like, of course you want to move there, but you didn't know anybody there. I um, didn't even know where it was. <laughs> right. Um, and then to try to get a building and to mm-hmm. do all that, like, wh- how do you even start? And it's expensive and all this thing, but you had a, you had a, you had a vision or you felt like God was telling you to do something and you were willing to be uncomfortable. And I think that when you plan, so I'm not saying that all your plans are going to be uncomfortable. We plan on going on vacation, you know, for our kid, this, it's going to be comfortable. I hope so. Right. I hope it's me a good vacation. But when we're talking about planning for the future, there has to be this idea that not everything's going to go the way that it's always mm. supposed to go. And, but if we plan for comfort, um, we may be let down, you know, in, in that. And so I think there has to be, we have to let go of the idea that we're meant to be comfortable. Josh talked about this on a podcast a couple uh, weeks ago about we're our, our need to be comfortable all the time. Like we, and we have medications for this, like how, you know, we have, uh, we have drinks for this alcohol, right? Like I want to be comfortable and we have to get out of that mindset. It's like, comfort over what God's calling us to do. And I think that's so, that means so much more um, to the people around us when we're willing to get uncomfortable for something that means more to us than just things or possessions or and whatever. And you could justify that. For example, right now, a lot of people are encouraging me, hey, don't you think you should retire, man? When are you going to retire? Not people in the church, but people outside of the church that do not understand what I'm doing. Uh, and it is tempting. I, I've always wanted to ranch. And I'm thinking, man, if I go back to Oklahoma or somewhere, I could buy a ranch. Mm. And you can justify it going, you know, I've put in almost 50 years. I can retire. And, and so you keep going back and forth. And uh, it is tempting mm-hmm. uh, to, to be comfortable and say, now I deserve to be comfortable. Do I really? I mean, I right. think one of the problems in the church world today, as well as, as maybe the secular world too, is a lot of the men and women who have finally arrived at a place to where they can be really very valuable, they retire, they go up the ladder, they leave. And I think especially in the ministry, but, uh, one like, guy in the minute or in the Bible that always just speaks to me is Caleb. Oh yeah. What was he? 85. Yes. And he's getting, you know, the choice land of the promised land. And he tells Joshua, he says, put me where the giants still are because I may, be, at the altar. I may be 85, but I feel like yeah. I'm 40 mm-hmm. and there's still work to be done. Mm-hmm. I use that very illustration in prayer today. I said, God, I feel like Caleb. Uh, I'm ready you do to go have out. a Caleb spirit. You do. Well, I thank will. you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm ready to go out and pioneer again. Yeah, I I tell me are. where to go. And the, I know you and, are. And I that think in you're itself crazy. Is unco- right, exactly. That's like the, and that's what I always love. Pastor, you, you went to Las Vegas and started the church yep. and didn't know anyone. You, saw, I love my favorite story, and that's what I think that's what got me into youth ministry. Is you're like, I went to Las Vegas. I didn't know one person, and I signed a. I think you signed a million dollar, seven hundred fifty thousand yeah, dollar lease. Yeah, a lease. And you're, and you're like, now what do I, and then you went home and said, you wept. I cried. You I cried. cried. <laughs> Go, what did you just do? And I'm like, why you had a going thing in bed? Who would do this? Why would, but you felt like God was telling you to do something. You know, Vince, what's funny. I was in a, uh, uh, denominational pastors meeting. There had to be several thousand pastors there. And one day, I don't know why, but the speaker said, how many of you guys right now would be willing to lose everything you have and go somewhere else right now? If God told you. Stand to your feet. And so I popped up and I was like five of us standing and I go, 
why isn't everybody standing? Mm. Mm. If God said go, and I was, well, five of us stood. That's wild. And I said, yeah, I'm always ready for a new project, something brand new. But, uh, you know, go back to what we said, going someplace where, you know, the grass is greener. And I know mm. there's a lot of people leaving this area uh, for other reasons, but, but think of Bakersfield. Okay, we're in Bakersfield. And I know there's some bad things, but number one, we're close to the beach. Yeah. We're really close to some beautiful redwoods and mountains. Yep. Uh, the housing is extremely affordable here. You can still buy a nice house for not a whole lot of money. You have the small city feel. Uh, the the county is conservative, which I really like. Air quality is bad. It's really bad. <laughs> it's really, I was going to say, what <laughs> were you going to say good about that? that? that that's <laughs> negative. But you know what? Uh, I got a. I have a little retirement place in Tatchby, and I'm thinking about making that my permanent residence. Well, there I will, is a whole lot better up there. I mm-hmm. will tell you, there's a friend of mine that was originally from Bakersfield who has been living in Ventura for about 13 years, and he just told me two days ago that his plans right now are to move back to Bakersfield. You can retire he, here. He loves it. Whatever. He loves it's, Bakersfield, and, and it's got the small city feel. And it's really good yeah. people here. Yeah, I, you know, the, and that's it's. <laughs> I, I lived in Ventura, so you know, for me to come back to Bakersfield, it was like that's you know, true. I, I was like too. you know, like God, like, do you want me to? And so I had to pray hard. I was like, I'm going to move to Idaho. Like I just don't want to come back to Bakersfield because of you know the bad air, all these things. I kept thinking, and but it was God. I was like, I, and when I got here, it was so crazy. Like you said, Pastor, God will meet your needs, and I got here, and I, I. Now I'm like, can I even leave this place? Mm. It's so, and, and that's God because I would, if somebody would have said, hey, can you leave this place? I, I do love it here now. I, and so, you know, I think Bakersfield has a charm. It grows on you. Yes. It might right now I'm in winter events. So I'm happy because it's mm-hmm. not hot. You know, the summer will come I'm like, why do I live here? You know? Um, but no, I, I think being uncomfortable, I know that I have a calling here right now. I know that I'm supposed to be here for this season. And so I'm enjoying it. And so, yeah, I'm okay with being a little bit uncomfortable, mm-hmm. uh, knowing that God has me here. Bakersfield right now. has been so good to us. And, uh, you know, the, the, the area, the, the, the political leaders, the people in law enforcement, uh, the mayor, I mean, yeah. s- county supervisors and city councilmen. So it's been really good to us. Yeah. And I think there's always that that natural thing that we all struggle with, that the grass is green on the other side of the mm-hmm. fence. But I've always said, so the crap's smellier too <laughs> on the other side of the fence. That's why the grass is greener. That's mm. right. And so every area has its uh, positives and negatives. Yeah. And so if God has us here, let's choose to look at the positives. Right. Oh, for sure. Well, and think, and thinking Jim's of, suffering in Thousand Oaks. So. Uh, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you, but I'm not are, even going to go there. Yeah. No. Oh, you know what's so cool is you before the podcast started, Pastor was in here, you were sharing your building plan process and how long it took you to get where you're at yeah, today. Yeah, it's like, almost two years. And most people, you know, when they think about starting a church, they're like, oh, you're going to start a church and it's going to grow and you're going to be able to build a building and it happens all fast. And it's like, that's not easy. Yeah. This will be our first official address. That's like so we've cool. been mobile, we've been sharing space with another church, and so this is like a what, milestone. What is moment. that address? Do you, do you know it? Yeah. Oh, can you say twenty three eighty two Townsgate Road in Westlake Village, California. There you go. So if you're close to that address and you're a listener, go check it out. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, you're you're blossoming in Thousand Oaks, and what's so crazy is what Vince elaborated on. Um, my wife, of course, after we've had the birth of a great grandchild down there. She goes, let's let's get our uh, retirement house down there. And, and as beautiful as it is, and you guys absolutely love it, I said, that's not where God's called me, and mm-hmm. I don't think I would be happy down there. God has me in Bakersfield. I'm happy here. And uh, and I, I also love Tehachapi area. And I think there's something to be said about how that God makes you happy with where he's called you. Yeah. Can I g- take you back to that sure. room in the where all the pastors were and— the guy said, you know, how many of you would just leave where you're at? Yeah. Because you live a surrendered life hmm. and you taught me how to live a surrendered life to Christ that all of our plans are fluid, aren't they? They are. Because they they're are. all mm. submitted to God. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I think of that, I, I forget, I think it's Proverbs 19, but it says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. It always prevails. And so I'm thinking... If we're surrendered. If we're surrendered. If we're not then, surrendered, it won't prevail. Right. So I, I always hold my plans loosely. And I mm. even told Tara when we launched that church, I said, this is going to be rough. It's going to be a rough season. But I said, just know it's a season. We're, we're going to get through the season. 
but this is the plan that God has for us right now, and it's it's not going to be comfortable at mm-hmm. all. It's going to be the opposite. But you know, we, I, that was a plan for the future. I said, get ready because we're going to hit some turbulence right now. But it's only going to be for a season. Well, what Vince said earlier too is we live for comfort. A lot of us do today. But were we really put on this earth to live for comfort? No. We're here, as I said, Jim, and I, I showed a picture of an airplane the other day with heaven on it. And I love that illustration, and a lot of you have heard me use it many times. But it's like the minute you got saved, you could, you got put on an airplane to heaven. And Bakersfield's our layover. And so we're, we're here to get a job done and get back on the plane going to heaven. Mm. So everybody has their layover place, and God doesn't want us all in the same places. He wants us in different places. But I think we do have to live our life in such a way that we're willing to go wherever he wants us to go, whenever he wants us to go. I'm always telling God, God, when do you want to give me another assignment? If you want to give me another assignment, it's like I'm in the military. I have assignments. Right now, my assignment is in Bakersfield, California Mm -hmm. and Las Vegas. That's my assignment. I I want to retire in the Hatchby area, possibly. That's in between Bakersfield and Las Vegas. But every uh, year I have to go back and reexamine, God, is your assignment still Mm. here for me in Bakersfield? Or do I have another assignment? I don't feel I'm just the pastor of VBF and pastor of uh, Valley Vegas. I'm a pastor in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, And my calling could change at any given time. And Mm -hmm. I love living that way because that's the great adventure. I love living that way. I love what you said too, Jim, about, because I know you, you're a planner. You've always been a planner. We actually call you the beaver, right? Because like the your personality types, right? You have yeah. otters, lions, beaver. You're like be- beaver, lion yeah, guy. I'm always anticipating. You're Right, right. So yeah. you're a planner. But for a lot of people, they struggle. I know a lot of my close friends, they struggle with the idea of holding your plans loosely. It's mm-hmm. like they, they want to make a plan and they want to cement it. Mm-hmm. And, and once they cement it, they're like, that's what I'm doing. I don't care. I don't care if God himself comes down and says, change your plans. They're going to do the thing that they set because they said it because maybe there's some pride there and they won't let go of that. And that's so hard for people. I think even for younger people, Mm -hmm. um, once they say something, they don't go back on it. And I don't know where that, I think that comes from pride, but it's like, I think that's huge holding your plans loosely. And I like what you said to examine it every year, pastor, you said every year I have to go back and say, God, where do you want to reassign me? Because that. That's everything. Because if if you make if you have a plan, and you go forward, and you're saying, "Well, now that's what I'm going to do," and you don't ever go back to prayer and ever say, "God, do you still want me doing this?" I think of an illustration yeah. I used years ago about the monkeys in the Amazon, and how they would trap these monkeys by uh, taking uh, a, some kind of ceramic or jar uh, that had a very thin uh, opening, and they'd put some food down in there that smelt real good and was attractive to the monkeys. The monkey would reach his hand. It barely fit in the in the you know the, the the beginning of the jar, and he'd stick his hand down there, and grab the food, and would try to pull his hand out. And these things would be bolted to the ground somewhere, fastened to the ground, and he couldn't get his hand out because now he has a fist made. If he would just simply let go of the food, he could have taken his hand out. But now, because he is uh, stubbornly hold, mm-hmm. holding on to that food and can't get his his hand out, they come up club him and have him for dinner. And I think you need to lo- hold everything with a loose hand mm. if your motto is like ours is mm-hmm. to walk in the spirit. Uh, I don't know what tomorrow holds. I think, again, what you said, Vince, I think it's wise to plan for the future. But even then, you have to know that you don't always know the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think there's a balance again, don't you? And Jim, you're more of a planner. Uh, I, I think that, you know, in that person, I don't know if I like you... this reputation. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're like you think we're, well, we just have shirts that say Jim the Beaver. <laughs> Jim the Beaver. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I think he's got more beaver than than I do. I know that's a good um, trait. I, I also get accused of that too because I'll make plans and everyone thinks I'm so stubborn with my plan, but I'm like. I just like to get ahead of things, but yeah. I'm, but I'm like very like once I'm like, okay, nobody wants to do that. That's fine. Let's go with the flow. Let's, but I just, let's do something. That's all I want. <laughs> At the end of the day, I'm like, I'm like, I just want to do something. Well, the, the better planning yeah. that you do, the more you can respond instead of react. And I think a lot of the trouble that happens in our life is that we're, we're not ready uh, or prepared for the things that we're facing. And then instead of responding, because it's almost like military training, right? Like I know what's coming at us. Yeah. And so I'm prepared for it. And I know planning and preparing kind of can become like synonyms, but they're they're kind of different too. 
It, yeah, I would say, and I know that I don't, I don't know, and maybe you guys can help me uh, land this, but I think it's sometimes hard also to, to live in the spiritual, but also be rigid in planning. One of the things I'm thinking of pastor it was so cool. Uh, Josh and I, um, along with a couple of the staff member have been planning events and things. And one of the things that pastors let us do is like, we plan for Christmas Eve, we plan for Easter. And so we had this Christmas Eve plan, uh, going into this last season. And, um, and we got to the very end and pastor said, Hey, Hey, time out guys. Like, I, I feel like we're missing some stuff here. So we had it all planned out. It was all planned out. Was that Christmas Eve? It was Christmas Eve. We have it all planned out, but I feel like we're missing we're missing something mm-hmm. here. And on paper, you could look at the program and said this looks good, but because he has such a spiritual tuning that's happening, you know, and and mm-hmm. and not that we don't, but he's also in the spiritual tune. Like God, what do you want to do in this service? He's like, we're going to change this plan and we're going to do some stuff that God is telling me mm-hmm. to do. And so I think there there has to again. This is a balanced conversation mm-hmm. of saying. We plan, like, do we have a program? Yes. If he would have made no changes, we would have done some stuff. Well, of course. But to be able to come back and change those plans because God mm-hmm. is saying, do mm-hmm. this is so important. And then being willing to work with people in that, because that's hard. Like when you're, when you, you probably see this as a, as a lead pastor of your church, when you, when ever you come to a staff meeting, you're saying, here's the plan guys. And then that plans change. How many people sometimes get frustrated with that? Oh, right. man. <laughs> but, but in order to, in order it's to true. see what God, God is doing, you have to be willing to constantly, because you're not just hearing God on Friday and then on Monday morning, you're like, oh, well, I'm not hearing, you know, you're constantly hearing God speak to you. And so if you're constantly hearing God speak to you, you have to be constantly willing to change your plans. Pastor Ron talks about margins all the time. If, if you have no margin in your life, if you're not planning for any time in between, then you don't have time to stop when God says, hey, stop and pray for this guy right here in the, in the grocery store or at the gym or at your school or wherever the case may be, because you didn't plan for it. And then all of a sudden you're like, I can't do that, God. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, there are personality traits, I think, that <laughs> sure. fall into this. And there are people that are super rigid and they they don't know how to be flexible. Right. And so like you tell them something and then that that's how it is. And then if you have to call an audible, because mm-hmm. stuff, as you pointed out earlier, doesn't always go to plan. It doesn't. And then as a leader, when you have to be the one to reveal like, <laughs> hey, we have to turn right uh, even though I, t- I said we were going to go straight, right. there are some people because of their personalities, they just lose it. They cannot handle like last minute changes. Right. And I was trained by the master <laughs> right. to spin on the dime. Yeah. Well, what do we tell new staff members when they come in? If you can't spin on a dime, you don't want to work here. You sh- uh, should not work I'm here. I'm notorious on a huge day like Easter where we're having 13,000 people come or 14. To go into the back on Easter morning and go, you know our plan? We're scrapping it. We're going to go a different direction. Yeah. And I kind of thrive on that. But, you know, I was thinking of this verse in Proverbs 4, uh, 6 and 7. I especially like verse 7. But verse 6 says, do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Mm. Love her and she'll watch over you. Now, verse 7 I really love. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. <laughs> that's, that's great. Right. And could we kind of summarize this by saying that we should really plan for the future the best we can, but then hold our plan with a loose grip. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be what we call balance. For example, and I, I, I hope to speak to a lot of young people today. A lot of you have given no thought about the future and that's not wise. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, I was raised around weight training guys and gym guys and Tom Touchstone can vouch for that. And I, I see a lot of these guys doing what I did in my younger years. I had to have my hair bleached because I like this blonde beach look. And I would lay in the sun, uh, not even thinking about the future so I could have this dark body. Um, there's a lot of people into bodybuilding today that are taking supplements that might shorten their life yep. and might make it miserable, but they're, they're living in the now. Mm-hmm. And so there has to be that balance of saying, no, I am going to be wise. I'm going to ask myself, where do I want to live at in 10 years from today or 15 or 20? Where do I want to, uh, uh, be at in my career 10 to 20 years from today? Where do I want to be at spiritually 10 to 20 years from today? Because it takes a long time Mm -hmm. even to learn how to hear God's voice and saying, that's my future and my moves today are always going to be made with that kept in mind. Mm -hmm. But hold it with a loose grip because God could change all that. Does that make sense? Yeah. You told me this years ago 
like live in such a way that your future self will high five you on. There you go. And, you know, we're doing a series right now called Dear Younger Me, and we should be thinking about future me. Yes. And, you know, our diet today mm-hmm. is really going to manifest itself in 10 years from today. Amen. Mm-hmm. The way we're living today Amen. is going to manifest itself in 10 years. The way we're treating our family is going to manifest itself in 10 years from today. Yeah. And well, what I, I, what I, do we, they say, Jim? They say that right now in your 40s, you are preparing your life for the way it's going to be in the 50s. Mm-hmm. The quality of your life in the 50s will be dependent upon what you mm-hmm. do in the 40s. Uh, if you're out there in your 30, your 40s, uh, the quality of life you have will be dependent on what you do right now in your 30s. And I'm in my, well, I won't even use my age. I don't like to use it anymore because people are going to turn me off. But uh, yeah, so you're preparing right now for the next decade. All right, right, exactly. I was going to say, you said uh, what you what you eat today, what you diet for today, it, it affects your future. I'm going to say when you turn 40, what you eat today affects your tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's immediate. It's like you see the result immediately. Um, one of the things that you said about the um, about planning too, I think a lot of people have planning paralysis, and I think that comes with a lot of things that um, happen in their life, right? Like they see people, they're fit, they see failed plans, or they try to do something and they fail, um, or they do something really well and they, and they feel like they'll never ever top that again. Does that make sense? We have this saying um, that we that we use in our culture: say, say I'm gonna, don't die on that mountain. And it has to do with, you know, like, like whether you fell or whatever the case may be, right? Like the idea of dying on the mountain, um, is that you've done something, then you just, you end up dying on it. Right. Um, and for a lot of you guys, you can't plan for, because maybe you've gone through a divorce. Maybe you have a failed business. Maybe, um, you feel like, you know, you grew up poor and you can't change that. That's a good point. Um, and so you, you feel like you, you have no future. You have nothing to look for, uh, look, look forward to. And so it's hard for you to plan forward, but then there's the other side of those people, um, where you've, you've, you are on the top of the mountain and you've won, right? So maybe you were like, uh, the guy in high school, uh, they always talk about the guy that peaked in high school, right? But maybe you used to be able to throw football over those mountains and maybe you were the best athlete in high school. And maybe, um, you once had a lot of money and maybe you already wrote a book and maybe you had a successful this and successful that, and you're living in that moment and you can't plan forward. And so I think a lot of people, they get stuck, um, in this planning paralysis because they're either living in the high or they're living in the low and they can't move forward. And I think both of you guys can speak to that. Like, how do you move forward? How do you make plans when you feel like you're paralyzed, like whether good or bad things have happened to you? Does that make sense? Well, you can feel trapped. Right. Uh, some people feel like they can't be open to whatever God has for them because like, I make a really good salary where I'm at right now. And, you know, I mm-hmm. can't lose this salary. I don't want to ever, you know, be in bondage to anything like that. And so I don't know what you want to add to that, Jim, but, um, you know, again, I think it goes back to my spiritual uh, commitment to Christ. I was going to say the same thing. Because That's what it goes back it, to. It really comes back to that, that, you know, Jesus is our hope. Mm-hmm. And so we're constantly thinking ahead because we know that one day we're going to be standing before him. Mm-hmm. And I know I, I live for that well done. Everything I'm doing now is for the well done that day that I stand before God mm. and and I have to give an account for the way I live my life. So this idea of like getting stuck in a fail right. or getting stuck in maybe a scarcity mindset that, man, I've never had enough money, right. that as I'm just keeping my eyes focused on the future of heaven and the future of being in front of Jesus, like he's got all the provision for me. So I just got to keep my, my eyes focused on him And then whatever kind of context I have, whether I don't have enough money or maybe I've tried something and I failed, like if, if I'm being led by him, I'm going to move forward. Whether I, we, when we started this church, we didn't have the money for Mm -hmm. it. We we didn't have the the resources and right. that we needed the, to check the box, but we stepped out anyway because we knew God was calling us to do it. So I didn't let that limit me and get me stuck because I knew God was in it. This idea kind of erupted from the idea of like I was thinking about the uh, the story that we that we know really familiar. Just the children of Egypt they're in sla- they're in bondage they're in slavery, and um, Moses th- helps deliver them out right through God, and so they end up. Um, going to Moses parts the sea, they walk to the sea, they get to the other side and um, they end up in the middle, they end up in the wilderness. Right. And they say, we'd rather be back in slavery. Right. They almost want, they wanted to go unearth 
the thing that was keeping them miserable because they didn't see themselves in a future in the desert. And I think a lot of that par- that, like that, um, that paralysis happens when we like, God does this thing for us. He gets us out of the slavery, right? We get saved. We get out of this slavery. We get out of this bondage. The idea of it, we walk through the waters, we get to the other side. And, and then all of a sudden we're like, Oh yeah, let me go unearth some of that old, let me go unearth that slavery. Let me go unearth this bondage that I used to be under because that seems a little bit better than being uncomfortable in the desert because I don't know what my future holds out here. Now you're just in this vastness. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. A lot of young people I would say are in that vastness right now. You know, I think a lot of it again goes back to this adventure we have in Christ. I'm wired in such a way that I love the adventure aspect of living for Christ. Um, I think if uh, I was told by God today to leave this big church that I'm pastoring right now and go to something with a hundred people, I don't find that discouraging. I find that really, really exciting because I know if God's calling me, there's going to be some great, great things happen. And I've always, you know, centered my life around a very simple, simple childlike faith. Um, And so again, I think uh, knowing that God is who he said he is and whatever he calls you to do, he will uh, bless that. He'll, he'll make a way for that to be successful and prosperous. God's not into doing unsuccessful things. Um, I was going to say something, and you know how those, those moments go. It goes right I through do. your head. Yep. Uh, but uh, uh, I just love serving God. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Sometimes I think we're so spiritually minded, we're no earthly good Mm. or little earthly good. Like right now, I feel very secure. Uh, I started, God used me to start a work in Las Vegas, which is very prosperous today. God used me to start a work in Bakersfield, which is really, really successful today. And I, I really feel in the bottom of my heart that I need to be in both these churches for a while longer. I don't think they are ready uh, yet to be on their own. They will be in the near future. And I so much believe in that, that, that God wants to use me in these two churches yet. I think I believe in that to such a degree that I don't think it'd be impossible for me to die today because God's not through. He wants me to train these people. And so it's more of a logical uh, mindset that makes me believe that than a spiritual mindset. Uh, It just makes sense. God says, raise up some people to take your place. And then when they're raised up and ready to start functioning in that role, then you're free to go. And so I think that... uh, I don't know. Does that make sense at all? Yeah. I think I'm rambling. Now. No, no, no. The logical uh, and the spiritual. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes sense. Yeah. It's, uh, some things are yeah. spiritual decisions and yep. some are very logical. Well, let me ask you this. You mentioned starting Bakersfield and that that started because you were asked to no longer be a youth pastor at another church. And I why, was basically kicked out. You were kicked out. Right. So, yeah, that's the best way to say it. What stopped you from not being paralyzed in that moment? Because most people would have been like, you're well, kicked simple. out of this church. Let's yeah. go back to, to what my life stands for. What kept me from being paralyzed in that mode? Uh, a vision. Mm. I didn't ask for that vision. I mean, I went to God in a very logical way, and I said, okay, God. Uh, they booted me out. I started working down in this little Pentecostal church in Potomac, and I have about <clears throat> 10 teenagers. And, well, it's kind of like booted out both places. Mm. I was in the assembly of God. And their youth pastor quit or they fired him, I don't know, whatever. And I said, hey, I'll lead youth. I'll volunteer. And they had like 20 youth at the time. And and God, it's all him using me. The group went from about 20 to about like 60. And man, we were going to blow. We were going to the park, man. We We were evangelizing. We were sitting around and worshiping with a guitar. And the group was growing, growing, growing. And one day our uh, lead pastor came in and said, you know what? You don't need to lead anymore. We went and got a real youth pastor. Uh, he, he, I don't know if he phrased it that way, but that's the way I heard it. Mm-hmm. And he said, this guy is ordained as assembly God pastor. We don't need you anymore. And it just broke my heart. I'm going, okay. wow, yeah. I'm not good enough to be your youth pastor. Look at the fruit mm-hmm. and what God was doing. So that's when I... I uh, Went down, I got a a revelation from God to go down and help my father-in-law, who was pastoring a little Pentecostal church in Potomac. 
And there it started growing, growing, growing. There were like only uh, 40 adults in that church, not even that, probably 25 adults. And God called me there to be a youth pastor. And I'll never forget the first Sunday I went in because I felt God had called me to be a youth pastor there. I felt that he confirmed it like three times. I walk in, da 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 I'm your new youth pastor. Looked around, there wasn't one person under 60 in the building. <laughs> and I thought, God, is this a joke? Well, long story short, uh, one of the older couples felt sorry for me and they brought their grandchild or child into our youth group. Mm-hmm. And and then somebody else made their kid come. So my youth group consisted of me, Debbie, and two young people. <laughs> and I was That's I great. would preach my heart out to these I bet. people every every year. I mean, this is where our church started yeah. from, right? Four uh, people in the youth group, including myself and my wife. And God spoke to me early on in my uh, ministry and said, if you'll be faithful in small things, I'll give you bigger. And so I was faithful to it. I was even offered a great job. Uh, being uh, a music, uh, a, a famous, there was two groups that traveled the United States and they liked me and they wanted to to give me a job as their, uh, what was the name in that day, their uh, agent or whatever. Yeah. The, anyway, yeah. They, they offered me an office what you're about. overlooking the ocean. Their manager. There. Yeah, manager. I mean, everything, but I stayed faithful to what God called me to do. And so uh, lo and behold, when they kicked me out and they did kick me out because this was an ultra Pentecostal church where they believed in running around yelling and screaming and speaking in tongues and dancing and jumping over pews. Mm -hmm. And and I told our young people, I said, you know what, what you see in the sanctuary, that's not really order, Christian order, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 14. And when they got wind of that, they booted me out. And so going back to your question, this this is a very long answer. No, I love this. Uh, Yeah, this is amazing. what, What changed is logically, I thought, I will take all these teenagers that are left over and I'll pray about a healthy church we should go to. And we'll all go to that church together and attend there together. We'll worship together. And if they don't want to go there, that's fine. But I'll at least give them a recommendation of a good church. In that process, Vince, I was praying, God, where should we go to church? Where should we go to church? And it's a vision. That's all I can compare it to. I had a vision. Only one I've ever had in my life. But I saw a big screen. It was just like a dream, but I was awake. A big screen, saw myself hanging a sign in front of some Quonset hut. I didn't even know what a Quonset hut was. And I was hanging a church sign, and God spoke to me so real. And he said, go, start a church for me in Bakersfield. Mm. So in answer to your question, um, God intervened. He interrupted the whole process and said, here's what you're going to do. I love what you said, though, too, because most people, they would have got kicked out, not one church, two churches. They'd have been like, I'm done. But you said you went and prayed. And I think that, I mean, and that led to that vision that God gave you. I think most people would have been like, I'm out. I don't even need to pray. I already know the answer. <laughs> you know, like they don't even give it a second thought. So that's good. I mean, I, I, that's, yeah. Well, and I was praying in a different way. Right. Where should I lead these kids yeah. to go to church at? I didn't even dream trying. at that moment of becoming a pastor. I did not have a desire to become a pastor. Yeah. I didn't, it didn't even enter my mind that I'd be a pastor. I mean, a youth leader, that was cool. I like doing that. So God gave you his plans as you yes. prayed. Jim, he downloaded I, his plans for your life. I still tell people today, if you move to a new community or go somewhere and you're looking for a church, one of the first things you should do is find out how that pastor was called to that place yeah. and see Good. if he was divinely called called by God, because there's a lot of pastors in our community today that chose this as a vocation. Yep. <laughs> I did not choose it. God ordered me to start a church in Bakersfield. Then God ordered me, instructed me to start a church in Vegas. I just simply did what he told me to do. Yeah. And well, I know that at Jeremiah 29, 11 oh, yeah. is a very famous verse. I know it's a promise for Israel, mm-hmm. but I do receive it as a promise for all of his God, all of God's kids, including mm-hmm. us. But, you know, this idea that the Lord has plans for you, not to harm you, but to prosper you, yes. to give you a future and a hope. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I know that's God's plan for my life, to give me a future and a hope. So if I just continue to entrust my life to him, those plans are going to happen. Like, my future is going to be taken care of. But I will say this, full circle it back. As I think about dear younger me, mm-hmm. I would tell my younger self, put some money away. Yes. 
invest, like, you know, put some money into a stock or put some money away for your kids. Because now let me tell you something. I got a daughter that got married. I got a, I got a son getting married. I got another daughter probably in the batter's box to get married soon. And I'm like, man, this is expensive. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Like, and I didn't save up for any of that. See, we didn't either. We live for the moment. And that's the reason behind this podcast today. There are some young people out there listening, and you are not preparing for the future, and you must prepare for the future. It's biblical to do that, Mm -hmm. and you need to start saving money. I mean, Debbie and I, in our third or fourth year of ministry, we were so poor. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had to actually put three jars out, and we'd cash our check, and we'd put, I think it was like, we each got $5 a month to spend on ourselves. I mean, it was ridiculous, and we put these jars out, we'd put our tithe in the first one, and then we'd put money for, uh, you know, bills and expenses. Mm-hmm. And then we'd get like $5 to spend on ourselves. And in those days, I could buy an album for 2 or $3, a Christian album. And I was really into that. Or if I wanted to go buy uh, a, a new gun or something, of course, I couldn't buy that for $5. But uh, And then we would accumulate it. Now, after three or four months, Debbie would sell over $20. And I mine would be gone. <laughs> and yep. so I'd start borrowing from hers. Oh, but we, we never... If we had started saving money then, I mean, we would have been so wise. If we would have had as a goal to pay a house off, mm-hmm. instead we jumped around from house to house to house. I think we moved like yeah. 22 times. I think you life. guys are part gypsy. We have gypsy in us for sure. <laughs> we stay never stay spot. one place over three years. And so real quickly, kind of uh, bringing this to a conclusion, but uh, I think if we live in such a way that we're trying to plan our future the best we can and hold it with a loose grip, mm. uh, what it'll do for you is it'll, uh, it'll help you uh, motivate yourself and keep your, yourself focused and organized uh, if you know what you want to do in the future. Um, let me probably bring this podcast to some sort of end here. Uh, Where do you want to be at in 20 years from today, spiritually speaking? Where do you want to be at as far as where you live at? Again, speaking to some of the younger people out there. If Bakersfield's not your place, then you better start thinking about it now. Because if you stay here a long time, this is not where God wants you. Your kids are going to get their roots here. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a whole lot harder to leave then than it is now. For most of you that are in this community, I would like to think that this is maybe where God planted you and you're going to be here the rest of your life. Is it not true that home is usually where where your family's at? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, today I might want to move back to Tennessee or Texas or Oklahoma or somewhere. But if I moved back there and didn't have my family back there, I wouldn't enjoy it at all. It'd be miserable. And so I think you need to think ahead. Some of you young people need to think about what you're doing. Is what you're doing, is it part of your your future? Uh, Again, I think we're going to just repeat ourselves now if we keep going on. But where do you want to be at spiritually? For example, I've had this vision for years that when I'm an old guy, which I'm getting close to, that I pictured myself sitting on the porch of a house in the mountains, chewing on a blade of grass. And I've arrived at at such a place, spiritually speaking, that, man, I just know God. That's my vision. And people come from other places going, there's this man of God. And he sits on his porch. He lives in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And man, if you need wisdom or prayer, he's out on his porch like from 10 o'clock to 2. You can drive up there and man, he can tell you what you need to know because he's so guided by the Spirit of God. We, We talked about Elisha last week how that he lived is the way I want to live. I want to grow to this place and I'm not there now. But how when he saw the lady come and the Shunammite woman, he said, man, something's bothering her. And I can't believe it. God hasn't even told me yet. He always tells me. Mm. And that's where I want to be. But for me to get to that place, I'm going to start planning right now. Because it takes a long time just to learn how to hear God's voice. And you need to apply yourself. So with that in mind, maybe you guys can kind of start leading us around to the uh, finish line here. Vince, uh, you're probably more familiar with the Pirates of the Caribbean ride than Pastor Ron is. Oh, no, I I just watched it 
Last week. No, no, not the the movie, the ride. Oh, oh the there, ride. As, oh. You, as you start the ride, there is this like shack as you're going, and there's a guy in a rocking chair. And I, I tell Tara every time I go, that's your dad's <laughs> goal right there. That's yeah, what he wants. And so we always think of you when yeah. we pass by yeah. this guy, and he's just it's rocking. A, yeah, I know what you're talking he's about. He's rocking in the chair. I was going to say, too, just to add just a little flavor to the end, um, one of the things you said is like when you plan for the future, I know, for speaking for myself, my my... 18 year old self versus my 20 year old self versus my 25, like wanted different things. And it would change because of my age and where I was at in life. And, um, it's, if I, if I framed it all about what does Vince want at age 20, age 30, age 40, um, you know, I think I'm going to get it wrong. So I think putting back in the frame, like what does God want for me? And then honing into that. And that comes with a lot of prayer and a lot of community being plugged into your church, um, because it's easy to think about what is my, you know, my 20 year old self, I can think about my 20 year old self. And it's like, he wanted the wrong things. Does that make sense? My 40 year old self is a completely different version of it. it's Vince 3.0 now, right? It's like Vince 1.0 is like a mess, you know, Vince 3.0 is getting it together. And then hopefully, you know, I evolve into, you know, Vince 5.0 and it gets even better. But, um, yeah, I, I just going back to what God wants and trying to hone that in, you're not going to get that perfect. Um, but if you can frame that, you know, uh, not around comfort and all those things, but mm-hmm. frame it around what God is doing. Well, I'm probably huge. being a little more practical. I'm saying even at 25 or 30, you ought to realize you need to be saving money for the future. Oh, for sure. Number two, you need to be taking care of your health for the future. Uh, number three, you know, you need to be thinking about what you want to do for a living. I think, again, we go back to the verses in James where it says a double-minded person should never, ever think they're going to get anything from God. And so I think if you're 25 years old or 30, you should be looking at the areas of life where, you know, things aren't really open for change so much when you think of health, saving money and those things, and you must plan for the future. And I think God gives us a lot more leeway than we think he does when it comes to where you want to live at. And I I think the 20-somethings need to talk to more our age. Yes, yes. And if they hear it enough times, because to your point, when you're in your 20s, you're not thinking about when you're 50. Nope. You're not. Right. But should you be? Yeah. To a degree. Yeah. To a degree. And and I think it's biblical. But the one thing, if I had to walk away today and hear what you guys are even saying, I'm learning from you. The loose grip thing, too, is so huge for young people. Um, and you, and it's it's exactly down your alley, Pastor, yeah. because you had a vision for a church. You want to start a church. I, one of the stories that I love that you share, uh, not a lot, but you share it, is you had um, your church saved up $10,000, and you needed that $10,000 to start your new work, and God told you to give it away. Makes no sense at all. So I think you have to be, yes. there, there's both. There's, the, again, balance. Balance. You have to be willing to let it go also and say, yes, I saved all this money, but God, you're telling me to give it to the church. Yes. That makes no sense. My give parents, it a teen challenge. When I went to work for the church, when I was when I was I was working for the city, and I told my parents I'm moving to Las Vegas and I'm gonna go work there for beans and rice for Jesus Christ. You know, <laughs> like I'm gonna make nothing, and but I'm gonna move there because I really feel like God's telling me to go be a youth pastor in Las Vegas. They're like, you are an idiot. Yep. They told me that, hmm. but I knew that that was the right move for me. But you followed another idiot because my parents told me the same thing. <laughs> they said, you're going to quit this union grocery store job to start a right. what? A church? And nobody was planting churches no, back yeah. in the 70s it like just that. just never happened. Yeah. I just wanted, at that moment, I knew I was doing, I knew, and I still would never, I wouldn't change, I wouldn't change that. I wouldn't, Vince, even you in, know yeah. how many times I pray this, this still today, I go, God, I prayed and prayed for wisdom and I haven't heard you or I don't. Uh, know what your will is in this area yet. So God, I prayed for, for a length of time now. So I'm heading this way. Feel free to stop me or interrupt me. But until you say differently, I've finally decided I'll just start going this way in faith. And he does interrupt me very many times. But Jim, you might remember this. When you came to me and you uh, talked to me about, you know, should I leave Vegas? Should I go to Thousand Oaks? And you were really uh, kind of struggling because you didn't want to miss God. And I said to you, I said, Jim, I don't think God so much cares where you're at as long as you're preaching the gospel Mm. and sharing the gospel. And I want you to be free from that burden today and just say, hey, I can go there and share the gospel sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think we struggle so much going, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And he goes, 
just do whatever you want to do, but keep me first. That's all I ask. I call that the paralysis of analysis. <laughs> and I think that's true in a lot of circumstances. Yes. Not all. Yeah, but that yeah, that was a big struggle because I was like, man, I don't want to be outside of God's will. And and I was so like afraid of making the wrong decision. Yeah. Yeah, but going back to what you're saying, like our God story is when we purchased that last house in Bakersfield, we had like 60 thousand dollars in equity like mm -hmm. saved up and, and that was pretty much our retirement because we had bounced around to you know doing these different works and i'm like okay we finally have kind of like a pseudo retirement you know some kind of a thing that we can you know lean into if things get tough right and that amount was the exact amount that we needed to start the church so we took that sixty thousand and invested that into what is now Atmosphere Church. Yep. And everybody would tell me that is a terrible right. planning decision. Yep. You are taking your livelihood. <laughs> in the natural, that made no sense. Just like in the natural, it made no sense for you to give that $10,000 away to Team no, Challenge. No. But sometimes the supernatural yep. is more important than the natural. Yep. Jim, and you're following in our footsteps. I had four houses and I was going to be this real estate tycoon. I had it all planned out. Mm. I get to five, then I take the one that I, I first bought and I trade it in. And I had this whole idea. And I had to use all four of those houses and the money I had invested in them to live off of because I couldn't make a living in the ministry at first. And I did. And yet today, God has blessed me in ways that I never thought he you would. You can't outgive him. You can't outgive God. Mm. No way. And so That's anyway... Good. Today, uh, I miss Josh's presence tremendously. He carries this podcast a lot. I think this is Josh's forte <laughs> podcast. He's good at it. We missed you, Josh. Uh, but Jim filled in tremendously well. And I'm glad you were here. Me and Vince would have struggled ourselves, I think. <laughs> but I hope you got something out of this today. I know we're all over the place going, you need to do this, yet you need to remember this. And, and so I think we're just up here talking and hopefully something we have said today mm -hmm. will trigger something in every listener going, whoa, I don't know about, you know, the content of the whole podcast, but man, I sure heard God in this. That's and good. so God will speak to you. And so, uh, man, we love you guys and we hope to have Jim back as yeah, a guest for at least again, once a guys. month. Yeah, yeah. When you come up here, yep. it's great. I uh, it. we love having you. And so next week, hopefully, we might be back with uh, Pastor Josh and uh, Tom Hollenbeck yep. and me and Vince. And then we do plan on having guests from time to time. So this podcast is going to change over time. It's going to take on a few different faces as we move forward. So again, love you guys. Want to hear from you. And anything, last thing you guys want to say? It was good. No, good time. Thank okay. you for having me again. Okay. Love you guys. See you later.